Father, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation that I might know you. Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I might know, Lord, the hope to which you have called me. Teach me, O oh Lord, to walk in that hope. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, we saw David's joy when the ark finally reached Jerusalem. What a man, what a man. We rarely see today in the New Covenant people baptized by the Holy Ghost, saved, living on this side of the cross, rejoicing over God in this way, this man. No wonder God said, here is a man after my own heart. Here is a man after my own heart. He was leaping and dancing and he didn't care who was watching him because he was rejoicing because the ark is in Jerusalem. This time, the ark is already in Jerusalem. Moreover, the ark has been safely been brought in. He failed in his first attempt to get it safely. Remember, somebody died. This time, he brought the ark in. Nobody died while trying to bring the ark in. And this teaches us the importance of doing God's things God's way. The importance of doing God's things God's way. Learn this lesson very early. Young ministers in waiting. We cannot do the things of God our way. There is no blessing in it. Now walk with God. The way is as important as the destination. Get this right. In our walk with God, the way we take is as important as the destination. The destination is the Father. The way is Jesus. Both are equally important. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. And that way is the truth. And in that way, when you walk in truth, you said there is life. At the end of it, you reach the Father. You, we can't do God's things our way. We can do it only His way. And often truth is very narrow. And often when we choose to follow God's truth, you and I will be called narrow-minded people. Praise God. If you're called narrow-minded because you're on the narrow way. <laughs> Last week we ended by seeing how David's worship was characterized by giving. Remember? At the end of it, scripture says, he offered burnt offerings and all, everything. He blessed the people in the name of the Lord of the host. And then, he didn't stop there. Our giving unto God. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, please put all the fans on. We have to learn to be still and be cool. <laughs> Remember this, if my giving stops with God, I have only loved God. And I have kept only half the commandments. Jesus said the law and the prophets hang on this too. Love God, love your neighbor. So if David had only given to God, he would be only half a believer. The scripture says that's not what he did. He put his hand deep into his own pockets. And scripture says he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both women and the men, to everyone. A loaf of bread, a piece of meat and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Our giving shouldn't stop with God. It should begin there. Getting the picture? In his praise, in his worship, there was exuberance, but there was also giving. 
If our worship and our praise just stops on Sunday morning after 30 minutes and after that there is no giving in our life, we still haven't worshipped truly. We need to ask ourselves today, the seventh day of this month, of this week, how much did we give? Perfect week, like I said, the seventh day is 7th of August is Sunday. Six days, how much did we give? How much did we sacrifice? How much did it cost you to be in the house of God today? Sacrifice always means it cost me. How did we walk the past six days? We looked the last few weeks and we saw at the beginning of this attempt there was death. Uzzah died. At the end also there was a different kind of death. Michal's womb died. She became barren. Those two are very, very important. It's connected with God and with man. In the beginning it was connected with who is worshipped. Who is worshipped? God is worshipped. And representing God for Israel was the ark. And Uzzah treated that ark casually and he died. At the end of what we learned the past few weeks, there is a worshipper. And Michal treated the worshipper with contempt. Her womb died. And it's significant. The significance is that one may call, your womb is dead. You will never give birth to a child. Your line ends with you. No worshipper will ever rise from you. Two, you are the first wife of David. Your seed will never sit on that throne. Things. One is the treated God's things, therefore God with contempt. Two, Michal treated the worshipper with contempt. As I said, do not be casual about either. Either the worship or the worshipper. Don't be casual about either. Don't say we are under grace and not law. Because that's exactly the point. Under grace, how much more is required of us, not less. We always look at grace as an escape hatch. Jesus said, no, under grace I require more from you, not less. If I said under law thou shalt not kill, under grace I said thou shalt not be angry. And call your brother therefore sin. So under grace much more is required. Because much more power is released. David was not satisfied with bringing the ark to the city. Please remember this man. He's not just satisfied with bringing the ark to the city. Now he wants to build the ark, the build the temple to keep the ark. He says no. I wonder. God says no to us. How would we take it? You won't build it. He says you won't build it. You know what? David had learned very well how to take a yes or a no from God. Young people, ministers in waiting, learn to take a no from God very well. Very well. In our zeal we may want to go. God says, no, don't go, wait. Don't go. But he says, you are not going, don't go. He says, you are not doing it, they are not doing it. This was the man's heart's desire to build your temple. I got the ark into the city, now I want to build the temple. God said, good, you brought the ark, I allowed you that much. But you are not going to build the temple. So, if we were in David's place, we would have sulked. David did not. If I cannot build the temple, then I am going to do the second best. I am going to get everything required to build the temple and keep it ready for the one who will build it. Think. Try to apply it to our lives. 
I have to remember the previous week's messages along with today's. Uzzah died because he treated God with contempt. Michal was judged because she treated the worshipper with contempt. The worshipper in the new covenant is the church. In both cases, judgment will come. If you treat God lightly or treat God's body lightly, you can take it well. Turn with me to First Chronicles in chapter 29. We will see David has made the preparations. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, because the temple is not for man, but the Lord God. Let's stop there. Understand this. First, get your priorities very clearly. The temple is not for man, it is for God. The church is not about man, it is about God. This church is for God, it is not for man. Every future pastor, remember, when you build a church, you build it for God, not for man. And that work is great. It's a big work, it's a difficult work. He's speaking to so many of us through this. His God is telling me, your son is inexperienced. By the time I step aside, you should have done everything possible so that he can take over the work. Remember, the house is about God. The temple is not for man, but the Lord God. First Peter chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. First Peter chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. Apply it in the new covenant. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are what being built up into a spiritual house. The temple has changed. God doesn't live anymore in a structure built with hands. He lives in his people. And what is the job of the, the, the people called to minister? To build God's house. Not to keep you entertained. Keep you entertained. But to build God's house where he can live. And it's about the house. It's about God. It's not about man. So the church we build at the individual level and at the corporate level is for God. Why do we work at our salvation? Work. Your salvation with fear and trembling. Why does he say that? Reason, I am making a house where God can dwell. Build a church that walks with reverence and fear and awe and love of God and love of one another. Why? Because God can reside in this abode. It's not about man. When it is about man, we change. But God says, the church was never about you. And therefore, when Michal looked at David with contempt, she was looking at God's temple. God's house. And God shut her up. Acts chapter 9, verse 4. After the journey he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5. Oh, yes. And he said, who are you? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He never said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? He said, you are persecuting me. You are not persecuting the church. When you touch the church, you touch me. Because the church is my house, it's my body. It's my body, it's my house. You are touching me. He didn't separate himself from his body. He did not separate himself from the house. He said, that's my house, that's where I live. And when you touch it, 
you touch me. See, under the law, the ark and the temple were two entities. There was an ark and there was a temple that was built. Under grace, the ark and the temple becomes one. At the end of this sermon, I believe you will start getting serious about what the church is. And that's what David learned. That's why in verse 1, David says, This house is about God and not about man. If it is about man, we will take the church and everything connected to the church very casually. We'll come when we feel like coming. We'll have all the excuses. And we will think it is all right without realizing. God doesn't take those things kindly because he says the church and me are one. With one. If you neglect the church, you neglect me. If you persecute the church, you persecute me. If you take the church lightly, you take me lightly. Oceans chapter 3 and verse 23. Because this is about God and not about man. The church is all about God and what God is doing in our midst. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Whatever you do, why? God is saying, you are not doing it to man. Though man may be the ultimate beneficiary, well, if you don't clean the floor of the church, it may not matter to anybody because you go home and sleep on clean sheets. But God says, it matters to me. It matters to me. It may not matter to you, but he says it matters to me. Because every little thing that happens, he says, is not just about the body, it's also about me. About me. Whatever he says you do, do it with all your heart. Because you are doing it unto God and not unto man. So if you are serving your pastor, then it will not last. The cat is away, the mice begins to play. The minute you see this truth, every one of you young people sitting over here, your dedication has been tested only for a little over a year. Ask yourself this question, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, where will I be? Will I be still following him with my face set like a flint towards Jerusalem? Will I still serving him and still serving whichever church, whichever place I am, still with even more devotion than how I started? Ask this question. Will I or won't I? Because we need to understand the church, missions, everything is about God. It's not about man. Man is secondary. Primary, it's all about God. And most people sitting in the church just pass through without ever really, really experiencing God's power. It's not because they didn't honor God so much. It's because they took his body lightly. And because they took his body lightly, he did not reveal himself also very seriously to them. It's as simple as that. Anybody who is married knows that fact. If somebody comes to your house and doesn't treat your wife well, he's not going to be a good friend. The man would take it as an insult. And God takes it as an insult. David was consumed with his desire to worship God and therefore now he is consumed with the desire to build the abode, the temple. Unless you are consumed with the desire to worship God, you will never be consumed truly to build his church. On the other hand, when you are consumed with desire to worship God, you don't need anybody to say anything. You will be there. You will be always found willing. Willing to make sacrifices for the temple. Old Testament for the church. New Testament. Getting the picture. 
Remember, for over 70 years, the ark had remained far away from Jerusalem. It was lost during the time of early, after that Samuel came, Saul came, ruled for 40 years. But it was only when David came into the throne, the ark became important. 70 years it has been sitting in somebody's house. When David came to the throne in Jerusalem, suddenly his first thing is that I need to bring the ark in. It's only truly when the seed of David King Jesus comes and is enthroned in your heart, Jerusalem, you will start thinking of bringing God's glory. Till then, you are you believe that King Saul is ruling. Flesh is ruling. Ruling for 40 years also and never bothered about the ark. The ark is to be used only if you need it to for a breakthrough. So people who come to church for a deliverance or a healing or a breakthrough, King Saul's reign in your life, not David's. Because King Saul went after the ark only whenever he needed a breakthrough. He was never interested in worshipping, was never interested in bringing the ark to Jerusalem. But when he died of his own hand, and another came, king became king of Jerusalem. And as soon as he becomes king of Jerusalem, he says, I want the ark in this city. When God, Jesus becomes the real Lord of your life, your worship will change. Your worship will change. Your attitude towards the church will change. Getting it? And now, the ark is in the city, he changes his focus. Now I have to build the temple. Your focus and my focus will also immediately change as soon as the ark is in the city. Now the focus is on the church. Lord, I need to build your house. I need to witness. I need to testify. I need to get more people into your kingdom. Those who are young believers, I need to encourage them. I need to, Lord, whatever it is that you have given me, I need to use it for your body, for your abode. But when the ark is not in your city, it's all about me. When will I get my breakthrough? When I will get over this? When I will when I will get married? Will my boyfriend ever come back? Will my girlfriend ever leave me? It's all King Saul's reign. It's not David. It's not David. David has already brought God into his, his, into his life. Now he says, let me build the temple. Build his abode. It will be all other things that are priority. Not for those whom Christ is Lord. It doesn't matter where you are working. Whether you are in ministry or not ministry, the focus will be always, how do I build a temple for him? How do I build a temple? Chapter 9, again, 4 to 6. The same portion. This is Saul of Tarsus. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, go to the city and you will be told what you must do. Come to verse 20. It says, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. He did not wait. Just a matter of days. He started speaking. You know what? Till yesterday I was telling you, Jesus is a fake. But I need to come back to you and put it right. Jesus is the real thing. Now, I'm going to build the body. Because the ark is already in. I'm not saying you will be called to preach, all of you. But definitely to testify and witness. And if you are not witnessing, you are not testifying, it doesn't care how long you are in the Lord. It's simply because King Saul is ruling. And not David. Not David. When David rules, the temple is built. When Saul rules, Jesus is acknowledged. You are still in Israel. The Philistines are always surrendering you. You are always looking to compromise to see how does it benefit me. Back to our portion, Chronicles 29. The first thing he says, 
this house, this abode, this palace is not for man. This is for God. Dear brothers and sisters sitting here in the house of God this morning, get this right. The gospel is not about man. It is about God who came to save man. See, all the religions in the world are man-centric. It's connected with man's good works. But the real gospel is God-centric. It's not about man's good work. It's God's good work. It's not about building a church where you and I can feel good and feel happy. That's all secondary. It's building a church where God can feel happy. Okay. That's when the entire history of God, of Israel, the presence of God actually came into the temple only a few times. Actual manifest glory of God they saw a few times only. That's when God was pleased with them. Then it went. So it's not about how much I feel good or all of us feel good. It's about whether God feels good. Ephesians chapter 5. It's about building a church where God can feel comfortable. Verse 25 to 27. So we come to Ephesians 5, 22, 21, we start worrying. Okay, so again, back to husbands and wives. Okay. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Okay, get this very clear. We leave marriage aside. For what? That you might look at the number of adjectives or verbs or whatever he uses. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Then that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blame. For what? So that he could present her to himself. For him. He says, that's the kind of bride I like. I know you can't do it, but I will do it. But be willing for me to work on you. The ministry of the church within the church is to make the church like this. To sanctify, to cleanse, to wash, to make holy, without blemish, spot or wrinkle. How does it all happen? By the washing of the water by the word. Are you getting it? When you miss this, what happens in your life? You are saying... I don't want to be presented to you that way. Every time you miss this, you are saying, I don't want to be presented that way. I'm, I'm comfortable the way I am. God says, but I am not. I am not. I'm not comfortable. God says, will you allow the word to work in you? I want to wash you. I want to cleanse you. I want to sanctify you. I want to make you holy. Why do you run away from the word? Why don't you apply the word in your lives? Why don't you do your studies with the word? Why don't you miss? And come to verse 29. What does he do? No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Think about it. Scripture says the Lord Jesus Christ nourishes us and cherishes us. It and God is saying, Are you allowing me to nourish you? Are you allowing me to nourish you? I cherish you, but are you allowing me to nourish you? The picture today it's not about God, today it's about the church and our attitude to the body of Christ. Wherever we belong, wherever we are rooted, go back to Corinthians 29, sorry, Chronicles 29. Our text, verse 1 and 2. Let's go to verse 2 and see what this great man says. Now for the house of my God I have prepared with... Now he doesn't say, now for God I have prepared with all my might. He says, now for the house of my God I have prepared with all my might. Second Samuel chapter 6 and verse 14. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 14. 
day we dance before the Lord with all his with all his might. It's only when you have prepared for the Lord with all your might, you will be able to prepare for his church with all your might. David doesn't keep anything away either from the Lord or from his house. Because he says, I danced with all my might for the Lord. Now I am preparing with all my might for his house. And God says in the new covenant, you cannot separate both. You are the same. I am the head, the church is the body. I am the head and the church is the body. Can we say this about ourselves? Ecclesiastic 9.10 Connected with the church. Can we say? Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Let's apply this only connected with the church. Simple thing, the place and the people and the activities of seven days. Wherever, whatever we have to do. Did we do it with all our might? Half the crowd wasn't even here when worship started. In fact, yet none would be late for a movie show. Because you don't even want to even to miss the trailer in the beginning. Many worship is like a trailer. Let it finish. Then when I'll come for the main show. God says, I don't understand it. I don't. Can we say this? I have given... To your house, O Lord, with all my mind. That's why I'm asking you young kids, you're one year on the road. Ask yourself, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years. I'm, I'm talking to all my pastors around the world also. Some of you are only 6 months old, 30 days old. Ask yourself, 15 years from now, would you be still serving God with all your might? You. My pastors almost quit last week under pressure. We don't quit while serving him or the body. Do we quit? You don't, we don't treat the body with contempt. God is asking, where is your mind? Where have you set? Colossians 3, 17. How do you, how do you serve? Principles are set forth in the scripture. Colossians 3 and verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do, maybe cleaning the toilets, arranging the chairs, putting up the sound, whatever. There's so many. You've made over and over again. You feel your call to pray. Sister Sarla is here, Arpana Prayer Ministry. You feel your burden for prisoners and helping at the juvenile home, whatever, Sister Elsa is there. Whatever it is, whichever area it is, there is a door open for you to serve God. And God says, do it all in word or deed. You cannot say, I am the only one living who has called for nothing. Nobody like that. Everybody was called for something. And God says, do it with all your might. All your might. A family of four went for a movie. The little boy watched the mother, because the ladies' queue is always smaller. Do they, do, these days, do they have a ladies' queue? This? Okay, I don't know. Okay. And he saw his mother give that 500 rupee note for four people. And they watched the movie happily. They came back. A couple of days later, it was Sunday. And church came. And kids can be extremely innocent. And the offering bag was being passed. The mother was picking carefully notes from the purse and giving. And in the stillness of the church, a loud whisper was heard. Mama, church is a lot cheaper than movies, right? <laughs> Truth of how we all began. Church was a lot cheaper than the things of this world. That's a fact. That's, that's why God finally stopped speaking to Israel for 400 years. He said, you know what? You don't honor me at all. Even your bosses back in your office, he was telling Israel, receive better honor than me. 
Church, he says, has become much cheaper than movies. Which is true. Which is true. How we struggle. How we struggle when it comes to giving time to anything connected with God. I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about money here at all. That's secondary. That's why we always say, first give yourself and then your money. When anything is connected with money or with time, connected with the church, how we struggle. How we struggle. God says, you know what? You are neglecting my temple, my house. David says, Lord, I have prepared for my house with all my might. Because if anyone could have sulked, it could have been David. I wanted to build the temple, but you said no. Okay, fine, I don't want to do anything with it. That's how a lot of people, a lot of people react. If they don't get what they want, they said, okay, I won't do anything else. David was piling up stuff to build a temple that was going to benefit somebody else. Do we do? When you are leaving your company for another company and you have to serve out your notice for two months, how do you serve out the two months? Magazine Kolkan? I say by Tega. Sarkari Kameta magazine, tiffin, chai, pani, sir. No work for the next two months. You know what? I'm serving my notice. It's anywhere for somebody else after two months. David said, No. I will never see this temple built. I will never worship in this temple. It's going to be built by another man for another set of people. But you know what? I love my God. I love his house. I am going to do with all my might. It's about him and about his house. It's not about us. It's not what do I get from this. It's never been about what do I get from this. Ask ourselves. Ask us. How do we serve this living God and his bride, the church? What if David had asked this question? What is in it for me? Understand this, church. Whenever you withhold from the church, whether it is your presence or your provision, you withhold it from Christ, not from man. You withhold it from man. You withhold it from Christ. When you refuse to serve the very body of Christ, you refuse to serve or help Christ himself. That's why when Nehemiah is working day and night to get the walls up and to rebuild Jerusalem, and Nehemiah 10 and verse 39, at the end of it, they say something. They say something straight from their heart, a set of people who for 70 years did not have the opportunity to worship the living God in a living temple. They say, we will not neglect the house of our God. We will not neglect the house of our God. We will not neglect. Ask yourself, will you, young ministers in waiting, will you, week after week, month after month, I have driven for one congregation member, just one, in the places where God has said, sent me. Preach with the same passion, I would preach before thousands. Because it was not about them, it was about God. A God who loves one sheep and a thousand. Because that's maybe the kind of places he may send you. He sent you, will you? Will you serve him and his body with the same kind of passion? You cannot withhold either your presence or your provision from his body. A little boy called George was absent. Monday, Monday from school. Tuesday when he came, the teacher said, George, did you miss school yesterday? He said, no ma'am, not a bit. The whole class missed George. But George did not miss the class at all. And often you do not realize the whole church misses those who don't come. But you don't come to church because you don't miss the church at all. Signifying with your very absence, saying that I am not connected to this body. 
And I will not get involved in anything. God says, I don't understand that Christianity. Day one, when the church began, scripture says they gathered together daily for the apostles' doctrine, for prayer, for fellowship, and for breaking of bread. And they held everything in common because they said, this is a body. This is his house. There is no other Christianity preached. There is nothing like that, what we are hearing. It's not like we come to church to do God a service. God says no. When you or two or three of you gather in my name, I am present. We become a body. The head gets connected to the head, the body. We become one. And you come together. That's what the people of Nehemiah said. We will not neglect. We will not forsake the house of God. We will not neglect. We will not forsake the house of God. Have you neglected the house of God? Have you forsaken the house of God? Let me tell you church, wherever cities, countries you are from, it will not go well with you. It didn't go well with Israel. It has never gone well with the church. Because God doesn't take those things lightly. He doesn't take your faith seriously at all. It won't go well with you. Not enough do we get excited because the ark of God has come. What about the temple for the ark to dwell? What about building up this church so that him, the prince of glory, may dwell with joy? And God says, where are you? David said, I have done it with all my might. Come to verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 29. Oh, a couple of verses is enough in Corinthians 29. You will see this man. Why this man is called... Chronicles 29. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of God. Where have I set my affection? I set my affection, my heart, my soul, I set it upon his house. He didn't say, God, he said the house. Everybody knows his heart is set on God. Everybody knows his heart is set on God. That everybody knows. Everybody says David's heart is set. Not only that, God says, you know what? This man's heart is not only set on my on me, it's also set on my house. Therefore, his throne on which my son sits will be always called the throne of David. Because my son, you know what? My son, Jesus Christ, God the Father says, his heart is set on me and upon the church, my house. And God is asking us, where have we set our hearts this morning? Ocean chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Where, where, where is our heart set? Where is our heart set? If then, suddenly you see, God is very, very careful about how we use this English language. He says, if. You know what if means? If means if. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are, which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. Where are your affections this morning? If indeed you have risen with Christ, you've got a whole set of young people who are going to get baptized on January 15th, um, August 15th. When you die, you die. When you come out of the water, you are supposed to have risen with Christ. Dead to this earth and living to the things above. Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. Verse 3, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Turn with me to Ephesians 2. If I am right, verse 6. And even verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where is the church seated? Bow. Set your mind on things about. What is that thing I have on earth which is actually about? The church. The church. 
and Christ. Christ and the church both are above. Set your mind on things that are above. Not on the earth. Not on the earth. On things that are above. The heart is in this world. Then the things of this world. And on the things of this world, God promises principle in the Bible. Corruption will set in. Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 21. The principle is this. Corruption will set in. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. What is that? Below. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure? I don't care if you call me fundamentalist. But if you truly belong to Christ, your heart and your treasure should be Christ and his body and nothing else. Nothing else in this world. Absolutely nothing else. Two loyalties to you and to your bride. I know no other loyalty. My heart is set on things above. And the only things above I know is you and your church. I go to the world to proclaim about you. And to prepare a bride for you. To add to your bride. To witness. I may work, but all that is just a, just a, a way, a means to serve your body. To serve you. Nothing else. That's what I said. If your heart is in this world, doesn't matter how little it is in the world, those areas, corruption will set in. Moth and rust will come in. Spiritual rust will come, moth will creep and you will be miserable. You will be miserable. You will be miserable. Look at what David says again in three, second part of verse 3. He says, I have set my heart on things above. 29, Chronicles 29, 3. Because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. Not only gave for the house what I gave as a king out of the royal treasury, but I also have given as David out of his personal treasury. Calculated it today is 20 billion dollars what he gave. Over and above I have given. God is asking, how much have we given? How much have we given? Oh Lord, I don't have much to give. He says you will never will have unless you start giving. Never have. Unless you tight and give with your first hundred rupees. You can dream about the thousand rupees. It will always be a dream. If it has to come from your God. How much have we given? Over and above? David says, I have given. Over and above. You know what? I pray this almost every day. When my time is over, Lord, and I have to face you. Let it be told, I gave over and above. Not just enough for you. Not just enough. I want to give over and above. Over and above. There's a man who says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6 to 7. He says, I have given over and above. New covenant priest. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have given over and above. It's time for me to die. My whole life is being poured out as a drink offering. This is not the prosperity gospel, children. This is not. This is a real gospel. This is a real gospel. So when you follow this gospel, you may lose everything. But you will gain what eyes haven't seen or ears heard when eternity comes. God is asking, what is that you have given? What is that you have given? How much have you given? David had to step forward as the leader and proclaim one, two, three, four, five. This is how I have given. Look at verse 3, 4. 
Three, he gives my own special treasure of gold and silver, 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, 7,000 talents of refined silver, two overlay the walls of the houses, the gold for things of gold, silver for things of silver, for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. Then he says, now who is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? He doesn't begin with asking this question. He begins by saying, this is what I am. As your leader, as my people, I'm telling you, this is what I am. This is what I am. It's about him. It's about his house. And I have given with all my might. I have given more than. Now, considering you think about your king as this, what about you? He says, as a king, I will not demand anything from you which I haven't given myself. Ask as potential future leaders, what will you ask your congregation? What will you ask? I have slept only two hours the last one day. Ask. Because I need to tell so that this man especially will not fear. There are certain things which I only tell him so that this fear goes out of his heart of serving this awesome God. How do you think all these things around in this world, missions are taking place? In the last two weeks alone, we sent along 300, 600 Bibles. Favor with God. You know how much it will actually cost us if we were to buy and post it? Over a lakh. It is more than the price of the Bibles. We have favor. Check with Shashi the accounts. Only a small little fraction of the church pays. Where does the rest of the money come from? Does it come from? The whole idea is that will you be able to learn to trust this God that if I give, He will trust you with even more? Ask the sister because she's the open door through which money goes out to the mission field. In the last month, do you know how much money I gave to send abroad? She said, How much? I said, I gave you 210,000. 2 lakh 10,000. Out of my account. I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you about this living God. Don't touch the church money. What? When I walk into a supermarket, when I look at the apples on the row, I tremble before I buy it because I know the money I have is stewardship. He's given it to me for a purpose, for his kingdom, for his house comes, just goes. Just comes, just goes. You think I couldn't buy a car? Of course I could buy a car. Past six months, forget a car, a Innova I could have bought. Past two years, two apartments and an Innova. Because I believe he has trusted me with his resources. And I pray I will remain trustworthy till the end so that his house can be built. That's why I keep telling this man, don't worry, don't worry. If he tells you to quit your job, quit. He will take care of you. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. Let me tell you, none of this money has come from US or Europe or any of this thing. Just one person in my family got touched. He got saved. My brother-in-law and my sister. They said, this is for you, for the mission. Use it. What I'm trying to tell you is that it's so very easy for me because it's all my family money. When I stand before God, it is not family money. It's His money. They will never ask me what you did with the money. None of you will also ever ask me what you did with the money because it's not church money either. But for 17 years, I have kept my accounts with God with no chartered account and looking through my accounts. I have kept my account with God for 17 years. When I left Assam, I left the church full. I didn't take a pie because my then wife worked. When I left Bhutan, I left the coffers full because I had a job, I didn't take a pie. When I leave, whenever I have to leave for a season, the coffers will be full. He will never struggle. Ask yourself, will God trust you with money? Can He trust you with money? Or you will immediately say, this is mine, let me go buy. Let me go buy. Can you be trusted? God trusted David with his resources. A lot of stuff you will hear. Don't believe all the gossip you hear. 
Lot of stuff you will hear about this man. I don't have to defend myself or explain before the world. But to you, I do. You will hear a lot of things. And let me tell you about my little kids. Two kids. Seven years ago. Literally, figuratively speaking, my ex-wife, their mother, put a gun on my head. Not a literal gun. I put a gun on my head and said, it's either your God or me. I said, my God. When I came back, she had packed and she had left. Took everything she wanted, she left. And this two little boy was four years and she was just nine. Six years later, last year, she changed exactly according. The enemy also knows the scripture. This time, another gun on my head and said, Okay, it's you keep telling, come back. Let me tell you one thing. I will come back. Now leave your church. There's no longer God now. It's the house. I said, no. She said, fine. I will never come back. This little fellow cried and wept. Her heart didn't change. She told him, I will never come back. It's over. Forget it. Do you know the real story? I'll tell you the real story. It was both God and his house. In these seven years, they always know how much money comes for dad. Because I always keep my accounts open before them. Tell them, have they ever, ever demanded anything from me? Not a new pair of dress has she asked me in seven years. Not a new toy has this little boy asked me in seven years. I never take them into any fancy restaurant or anywhere. Seven years, six movies. All Narnia and Journey to the End of the Earth. They have never ever complained. Ever complained. Never said anything. But they knew this was about God. This was about God. Yet, stories circle in the city about them too. I know the price they have paid. God will touch them and reward them when the season comes. You need to realize there is a real living God. It's a real living God. For this living God, He didn't need United States of America or Europe or anywhere to touch. He just touched my brother in law. It's all. Last night I talked to him for a long time. I said, you know what? This is what the Lord tells me. God says, to some I have given the ability, the gift to help, to generate wealth. You are one of them. Just remain faithful over there. God will increase your empire. I said, now I ask you one thing. Separate one day a week to fast and seek the face of the Lord. How to run your business. He will show you his secrets. Not what the business school teaches. Because this is about his kingdom. I'm telling you, it is possible to serve this living God. And never, ever worry. You know why? Because terrible, terrible times are coming. And I need to speak out open like David spoke to his people saying, Get your house ready. Get your finances ready. Get your heart ready. Because only they will survive what is coming. Otherwise you will give up. And you will compromise. And you will run away. Most difficult times known in human history is coming. And all those places where turmoil is taking place, our churches are full and packed. Because they don't preach a feel-good gospel there. They speak the authentic thing. Put your house right, put your life right. There is a God who will stand by you and take you through. God doesn't play dice. He doesn't gamble. He walks with his people, he talks with his people. And his way is very narrow. I tell this young man, don't, don't fear, don't fear about provision. I told the same thing to my young pastor Cyrus when I mentored him. Don't fear provision. Just walk with God. He will take care of it. Start in ministry. Every child of God never ever provide, worry about provision. But the only way you will know it when you open your hands. Honestly, I know I have come to a point in my life where I don't know whether the money is mine or his. You will know whose money it is. Is it mine or yours? Comes close, just comes close, just comes close, just comes close. And my brother-in-law is very smart to see that I don't have any legal trouble. He's opened an NRI account, signed all the checkbook, given it to me and said, I put in, you spend, it's up to you. For the Bibles reach us in nations. The transcripts reach us in nations. Sammy, when he's in hospital, John is in hospital, in the HIV homes, the money goes. The money keeps on coming, the money goes. 
they're being taken care of. Think about all of us open to God and open with our finances before God and said, I will serve you with all my might and I will give you over and above. Think, think. But honestly, the basic fear in most hearts is this. What is that? My name is Jimmy. Please give me. <laughs> God said, I will give you. On one condition, I will give you. That as fast as I give, you also spend, give it away as fast. Then you will see it will, the flow will never, never stop. It will never, never stop. Let the fear of provision go out of your hearts. You cannot lose by serving this God. You can never, never lose. Keep your life simple. Telling you young ministers in meeting, keep your life simple. Don't complicate it. When I'm alone, I still choose to sleep on my old rug on the floor because I never want to forget from where my God picked me. Where he picked me from. I know what he's giving into my hands. Scares me when I see what is happening. Scares me. Is this really you, God? How can you trust a man like this? Scares me. We have no clue. Half the testimonies I can't even tell in the church. God is saying he's raising up a generation of young men and women right from here. Who will walk this land and take his testimony and build his house. And God is asking the simple questions that David said. This abode is for God, not for man. And I have prepared it with all my might. Moreover, I set my affections on the house of God. And have given to the house of God over and above. Therefore, who then is willing to consecrate? Then only verse 6 onwards, the leaders come, the others come and the people come. Now everybody is giving cheerfully and mightily. You know what? With a man led. I think is, will you also give your time? Time? And your resources? Your strength? Your energy? To bringing the people in to my house? That's how the house is built. You have to take an unbelieving man. Pray, 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 give him the gospel. And when he gets saved, he becomes a living stone. Put him into the house. One more hole is filled. Take the next one. Pray, 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 give him the gospel. He gets saved, another living stone. Put him over there. That is how the living house is built. And the cornerstone is Jesus Christ. And one day when the house is finished, scripture says in the book of Zechariah, with Christ of grace, grace to save, the capstone also will be put. That's also Jesus Christ. Meaning the whole work from the beginning till the end was the work of Jesus and Jesus alone. It was about him and his house. And nothing else. Therefore Paul says, put your mind, your affections on things that are above. Half-hearted people will not last these times. I'm telling you. Perilous times are coming in the last days, Paul says to Timothy. And he says, wicked people will wax stronger and stronger and stronger. And the waxing stronger and stronger all around the earth, all around our nation. All the Babas are not going to say well. They can fast, they can do everything, nothing, no corruption is going to change in this country. It's going to become more and more and more worse until the Prince of Glory comes and rules with a scepter of iron. He will stamp out corruption. He will show what righteousness and justice is. No man will be able to do that. So forget about forwarding those SMSs and things. Nothing is going to happen. Nothing is going to happen. At the most when the police comes, he'll get into a lady's salwar and run. Nothing else is going to happen. It's only our God who is going to change. He says, put your eyes on God and his church. The only thing that matters to me on earth is his church. And to get the people into the church. And that's the only thing that should matter to any one of us. He and his body. And if you're wasting your time on other things, God says, I will call you to account. I don't mince the gospel. God says, I will call you to account. Every one of them in the gospel, when they saw Jesus, didn't say, 
blue eyes, gentle looks, they said like fire. We couldn't look at his face, they fell flat. Because his eyes saw through all our hypocrisy, our lies, our excuses and our love with this world. This, with your lips you came near me, but your hearts were so far away from me. In vain you call upon my name. Whether we are young or old, no excuses. That's why God has specifically given this church the youngest missionary at three and the oldest at 105. No excuse from there to there. Anybody, any place, anywhere can be on fire for God and for his house. And when you come to the table, this is with which you come. This is about him. This is about your house. Why? Because you gave. You gave. How much did God give? He gave his everything. He gave his everything. He gave his son. How much did we give? How much did we give? I don't know. Each one of us knows how much we give. And I'm not talking about money. Though it's important. Money is also important. God says, bring my tithes and offerings to my house. In the book of Malachi, otherwise. And after that, he stopped speaking to them for 400 years. They didn't listen to that also. I think of this Sunday's message is Sermon on the Amount. Are we ready? How much will you give? Which will we give? Just think about it. See, when you take this stand, let me tell you, some of you will be all alone. There will be nobody with you or beside you. So God says, count the cost. Lord, I am starting this, trusting you, believing you. I want to run and I want to finish. I want to run, I want to finish. I will stand by you. But I may not be there always. But I want to finish. I want to run. I want to finish. I the elders to come. The worship team to come. And when you are coming this morning, preparing your heart, please remember the message that we just heard. Whatever you are called to do, whatever you have been doing in the house of God, you know what it is. God says, do not forsake my house. Do not forsake my house. We heard about the ark. We heard about the temple too. about all the confusions, the arguments we have in our heart, in our mind, not our heart, when we go back today. You see, most of those arguments, they're just connected with this world. We go into communion, I want to really, really ask you, each one who serves at some point, at some post in this church, I want to ask the worship team, did you give your all and above for the worship? To ask the Sunday school teachers, do you give your all and above for these children, believing you're building his house, over and above, fasting and praying for those children, sitting and meditating upon that simple Sunday school lesson so that you're building his house, or the ones who clean, the ones who go out to minister. So many people here, so many people involved in so many things connected with his body. God is saying, how did you give? How did you give? What did it cost you? Did you just give it out of the national treasury? Or did you give out over and above from your private treasury, your strength, your energy, your time. He said, I kept nothing back when it came to you. 
I gave you my best. Over and above. There were billions upon billions of angels. But over and above, I gave you my own son. And after that, I gave you my spirit. And the church is built on the foundation of all my apostles. Every one of them who lost their life. So that this house could be built. And even today, many will be killed for the sake of the house. Many, many will be killed for the sake of his house. In so many nations. But they all have become living stones. They just didn't die for the living God. They also died for the living church. What has it cost us? What has it cost us? I'm telling anyone here struggling. Struggling with whatever in your life. Provision. Sickness. Addiction. It over to God. Hand over your life to God. Hand over your everything to God and say, Lord, here I am. David challenged his people centuries back. But Father, today I take up that challenge. Who will consecrate, sanctify himself for the sake of this house? You can say, Lord, here I. When the cup and the bread comes to me, I proclaim a God, here I. Here I. Swear. This is your body that was broken. This is your blood that was shed. And now when I stand holding that body and that blood symbols of it in my hand, I'm proclaiming to you, O Lord, I'll be given over for you and for your house as you were given over for me and your house. Let our half-heartedness just depart. Let's stop fooling around with God and His house. Uzzah died because he treated God with contempt. Michal died because she treated God's house, the true worshipper, with contempt. A womb was barren. Let me tell you, church, this morning, if there is barrenness in your life, maybe we need to go back home and get on our knees and say, Lord, why is my life barren? Why is nothing coming out of it? Why is all doors seems to be shut? Why there is no life? You said, rivers of living water shall flow. Why is it stopped? Why has it become stagnant? Maybe. Maybe because you took his body, his house, his precious bride, took it for granted, treated her with contempt. Is ever willing to forgive. All we have to do is run back to the cross, even now, and say, Lord, here I come. I'm sorry. I messed up. Give me a fresh chance, a fresh start, a fresh anointing. I want to walk with you and to live for you and for your house. That I may build a house, O oh Lord, where your glory may rest. That I too may be a part of that. Of this great and awesome work you are doing around the world. I too want to be a part of it, O oh God. I want to give over and above. And I want to serve with all my might. For that, O oh God, today. I consecrate myself. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take this, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same manner, took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. It's note. He said, It's a new covenant in my blood. Not in the blood of oxen, 
or bulls or rams or sheep or goats. This is a covenant which he has made with his own blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. If you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't put things right with God, when the bread and the cup comes, let it pass. Hold it in your hands and we shall partake of it together. Shall we pray? So this morning, even as we stand here in your presence, stand here in awe of who you are, mighty God, awesome God. Who are we, O oh God, that you should take just notice even of us? We're just a speck in this universe. We're just nothing. Here today, gone tomorrow. But for us, you chose. You chose to die. For us, you choose to show forth your mercy each morning. For us, you choose to show forth your grace each day. To wash us clean with your word. That we might be without spot or wrinkle, stain or blemish. That you could present us to yourself. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the love you have shown to us. And I pray this morning, O oh God, as we go finally from this house, we'll go with our heart, surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Our hearts are set on things above on our risen Savior and the bride that is seated next to Him, in Him. Walk with the knowledge that we are just aliens and sojourners passing through this world. Our citizenship is from above. That even death has lost its power over us. Therefore we fear nothing. Because on the cross, O oh Lord, you overcame death for us. Therefore we are people without fear. Therefore the world calls us peculiar. For we neither fear famine nor the sword. Because we have overcome death. Because you overcame death for us. come to this table this morning we come with that boldness and with that strength and we look death in its eye and say oh death where is your sting look the devil at his face and we tell him what can you do to me for greater is he that is in me than who is in the world for this purpose the son of God came that he may destroy the works of the devil Father I prayed this morning in your house, as consecrated hearts partake of this bread and partake of this wine, iron cords and brass chains will be broken. It will be broken. There is deliverance in your house. There is power in your blood. Father, today as your servant, I plead your blood over your people. To walk out. The earth below their feet will be iron no more, nor the sky grass. The earth will resound with the shout of victory. And the sky will show the color of the hem of your robe. Father, let a set of consecrated, sanctified people go out into the world from your house today so that each one of us together may build your house. Thank you, Father. Thank you. From the beginning till the end, it's all, all your work. Work alone. 
Thank you, Father. For in Jesus' name we pray. In thy house. We thank you for your goodness. God, show each one of us how we need to respond to you. How do we respond to the love on the cross? The dedication on the cross? The surrender on the cross? Yes. Each one of us here, young and old, we need courage, we need strength, we need boldness. need you. More, Lord, more of you. Just want to die inside all of us. Things of this world, <coughs> desires, aspirations. And I put it all on the altar. The word says in Romans 12, 1, this is our reasonable sacrifice to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Reasonable act of worship. Oh, Father, we want to give more, more, as David did. Met all our churches, all the other pastors, some standing now before the congregation, the others who will stand later through the day, till tomorrow morning, some of them will be standing for 12 hours, 14 hours, ministry, pray. Oh, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, you will stand beside them. The multitudes, the tens and thousands who are coming, they are coming to you, Lord. They are not coming to man. They are coming to you because they have heard in the time of famine, they have heard there is bread in Bethlehem. They have heard the Lord has visited Bethlehem again. They are coming, Lord, in their tens and in their thousands, walking by buses, driving, taking flights, trains, everywhere possible they are coming, Lord. Because they have heard there is bread in your house. Oh, Father, fill them. Fill them, Lord, fill them. Let them know that you are real, living God. Touch them with your Holy Spirit. With your fire, that each one will hold back nothing. They'll give you everything. Because you deserve our everything. We are not 10% people, oh God. We are 100% people. Everything we put our hand. Today, tomorrow, through the week. Help us to do it as unto you. With all our might, all our strength. So that the glory may be yours. And the power may be yours. Thank you. So continue speaking to these young ones who are getting baptized. Speak to them. Speak to them. Prepare them. Idols that need to be broken. Habits that need to be given up. Anything. They are obedient to God. You just speak to them. They will listen. Father, thank you. We see God. We worship you, God. We give you glory. Such an awesome, wonderful God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for speaking to us this morning. For ministering to me, Lord, I thank you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with each one of us. Amen. Amen.